We come today to the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. But 60 years ago, last week, the Queen made the promises of her lifetime. She promised to govern the people according to their respective laws and customs. Secondly, she promised to cause law and justice in mercy to be executed in all her judgments. Thirdly, she promised to maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel. And then she also promised to maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion. For those Anglicans who think Anglicanism is a via media between Protestantism and Catholicism, they are wrong. Anglicanism is Protestant, not Lutheran, but Reformed as its character of faith. And the Queen is in upholding, the head of the Church of England is to be upholding the Protestant Reformed religion. That's what she and every monarch since the coming of uh, William of Orange and Mary of Orange, that is in 1688, have promised. Then laying her hand on the Bible, she said, the things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. Here is the really central important part of a coronation, an undertaking of responsibilities to her people, responsibilities that she is to keep and to maintain for her life. And in these last 60 years, the behaviour we have all seen has been of a woman diligently and faithfully fulfilling the promises that she made back on that day in June 1953. Her faithfulness to her promises have won her admiration and affection around the world. Her life hasn't always been easy for her in those 50 years, watching the decline and death of her sister and her mother, the divorce of three of her four children, the awful death of Princess Diana. But yet she has remained as one of those steady, reliable fixtures of life that help society to remain stable, especially in one of the most fast-moving periods of social change and history. She's been a woman of faith, not just in her constant declaration of her Christian beliefs, but also in her faithful execution of her duties. And so she is a model of faith. And it may seem strange that on a day when we would sing the royal anthem and remember the Queen, that I'm going to preach on adultery. But that is because the opposite of adultery is faithfulness and she is the epitome of faithfulness. For that is the nature of faith. Though most of our society doesn't seem to understand it today and doesn't appreciate its value. It's, faith is a little like the security and safety we feel about the earth. We don't have New Zealand's earthquakes here in Australia. We're not the shaky island. They are the shaky isle. And so we take for granted the sense of security we feel. We give no thought to the earth moving beneath our feet. But it's this stability that enables us to live and to build and plan for the future as the people of Christchurch now find it so difficult to build and plan for the future. Faith is like that. When present, it's so valuable that you can build your life on it. When absent, life becomes unlivable. But what is this faith of which I'm talking? What does the word faith mean? mean? What is the phenomenon that is described by this word? Well, one way of understanding it is intellectual. Its opposite is doubt and its synonym is superstition. This is the atheist's understanding of faith. 
You see it in Professor Dawkins' books. For him, faith is an intellectual activity whose religious alternative is doubt. But because people of faith religiously refuse to doubt or to look rationally at the available evidences which would confirm their doubt and undermine their faith, what religious people come for Professor Dawkins is superstitious. And so for him, faith is superstition. I'm now reading the latest book of, by an atheist philosopher, A.C. Grayling, a professor of philosophy at Burbank University in London. Uh, it's called The God Argument. In it, he quotes Mark Twain with approval. Faith is believing what you know ain't so. If Mr Dawkins could write like Mark Twain, he would save a lot of pages. <laughs> to Professor Grayling, by, he writes, by faith is meant belief held independently of whether there is testable evidence in its favour or indeed even in the face of counter-evidence. Faith is superstition for atheists. And so for Professor Grayling, he writes, religion is superstition. All religious people are superstitious. But not all superstitious people are religious, he goes on to say. So if you're religious, the atheist thinks you are superstitious. And the word faith is that very word which means superstitious. Now neither the scientist Professor Dawkins nor the philosopher Professor Grayling understand the subject they're writing about. In fact, they revel in not wasting time studying the God about whom they write. They glory in the argument of likening belief in God to belief in fairies. And they say, nobody expects us to study fairies. Well, then why would you expect us to study God? I can write a book against fairies without studying fairies because I don't believe in fairies. I can write a book about God without studying God because I don't believe in God. They're just like fairies. You wouldn't expect me to actually do a careful analysis of the different theories of fairies. Well, then why do you expect me to do analysis of the different theories of God? Because faith to them is superstition. And if you know that, for them, you know enough not to bother studying it, just to write books against it. But the problem is that faith is not intellectual inquiry at all. They've placed it in the wrong context, in the wrong setting, in the wrong paradigm. Faith is about relationships, not about intellectual inquiry. Faith is relational reliability. That is, faith means trust. And whenever you word the word faith in the Bible, you could cross it out and write the word trust in and you would mean what the Bible writer means. It's not a religious word, faith, any more than trust is a religious word. It means exactly the same thing. Indeed, it means exactly the same thing as belief and believe and quite often we use that word because we haven't got the verb to faith. So we have belief and believe, but we've got faith and we don't have I, I faith, you faith, he, she or it faiths. We, we don't have a verb, so we use the word believe. But in the Greek and in the Hebrew, it's exactly the same word. Faith means believe, means trust, means rely, means depend. And they are fundamentally relationship words. It's not what you know, but whom you trust and how you relate to them. It's not about evidences and arguments, but about being trustworthy and able to be relied upon. That's not to say that faith is either superstitious or irrational. It's neither superstitious or irrational to trust my wife. She is thoroughly trustworthy. I have the evidence of the last 49 years of knowing her. I have the evidence of the last 44 years of being married to her. My faith in her, my trust in her, is well founded on first class evidence and sound reasoning. And if it weren't, she would tell me. When you meet someone, you trust them. 
until they show themselves untrustworthy. And then, of course, it would be silly to go on trusting them. Then you don't trust them, but you treat them with suspicion. Now, as long as you trust people, they're your friends. But when you're suspicious of people, then friendship dries up. And so trust is something that humans do all the time with each other. It's just one of the normal characteristics of life that all of us have. And faith is therefore, it's not an intellectual inquiry, but a relational reliability. Now the reason the Bible is about faith and faithfulness is because it's about God, the personal God, who makes covenants with us and is about covenantal promise keeping. See, God makes covenants or contracts with us. Now the Latin word for covenant is testament. And our Bible is made up of two testaments. Old Testament, New Testament. That means old covenant, new covenant. That is old contract, new contract that God makes with his people. And the nature of the contracts or the covenants is that I give you a promise and the conditions and obligations and requirements that go with having that promise fulfilled. You undertake to fulfill these requirements and I deliver to you whatever I've promised. So you give me $10,000 and I will give you my car. You give me the money, I give you the car keys and we sign the deal by filling in the little contract, the little covenant on the back of the registration papers. I then can't come and take the car back. I can't then have a second key which I come and steal the car at night and you're not supposed to cancel the cheque. I'm taking you at your word, you're taking me at your word, you're taking my car, I'm taking your money. It's just a contract of arrangement between us. If you give me this money, I will give you my car. Now the greatest covenant that most of us commit to is marriage, where we promise to love and to serve each other for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, and to keep only to each other as long as we both shall live. Faith is keeping that promise. And faithlessness is breaking that promise. God undertook a similar marriage covenant with the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. He promised to be their God and they promised to be his people. They agreed to his contract and he laid out the requirements of what it would mean to be his people. The basic requirements are what we call the Ten Commandments that we've been studying over the last few months and of which we come to number seven today, you shall not commit adultery. Or as the Hebrew puts it, no adultery. Difficult to kind of know what to do with a commandment like that. You can quarrel about the word no or you can quarrel about the word adultery but that doesn't really leave you much room for quarrelling at all, does it? No adultery. They have to be without adultery if they're going to be God's people. They had to be faithful to him and faithful to one another because God is the God of faithfulness. It's one of the key characteristics of God and one that marks him out from different from the other gods of the ancient world. He gives his word and then he keeps his word. He makes his promise and then he fulfills his promise. He's not unreliable or fickle. He doesn't change his, his mind as his mood alters. He's trustworthy, dependable, reliable, faithful. And so the Apostle Paul writes of him, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Or later in the same book, no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This faithfulness of God was seen in his covenantal marriage that he made with Israel. 
So Isaiah speaks of God as Israel's husband. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. Or Jeremiah says much the same when he speaks of Israel's unfaithfulness to God, their husband, and God making a new covenant with them that will be not like the covenant that I made with your fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. God married Israel in the wilderness at Mount Sinai when he became their God and they became his people. And while the people were unfaithful, he always remained faithful. For he is like the rock. I don't know how you imagine God, but all the imaginations of men get it wrong. That's why our religious art never works. But as good an imagination as you can have of God, one of the ways in which he presents himself in the scriptures is the rock. That is what he is like. In chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, he's called the rock four times. The rock. His work is perfect for all his ways of justice, a God of faithfulness. And without iniquity, just and upright is he. He is like a great rock that you can rely upon, you can depend upon, you can build upon, is immovable, is fixed. For that is the meaning of this faithfulness, of faith. Faith is a firmness a fixity, it, it's a trusting the trustworthy, it's depending upon the dependable, it's relying upon that which is reliable. Faith is being faithful, it's being fixed and firm in your life's choices and in all your undertakings and in your very character and nature. It can be rational, it can be irrational, sensible or stupid, but the rationality isn't the essence of the faith. The trustworthiness, the reliability, the dependability, that's the essence of it. The man of faith is the one whose word is his bond. He will fulfill his promise even to his own hurt. As Psalm 15 has it, for God having given his word will keep his word. So it's only wise to trust and rely upon him and silly and stupid not to rely upon him. And as with God, so with the man of God. When a man of faith swears an oath, he will fulfil it to his own hurt, but he will fulfil it. For a man of faith is always faithful to his word. To break your word is to break relationships with people and with God and that is the violence of faithlessness it's seen nowhere more powerfully than the than in marriage and adultery so turn with me to our second reading this morning sorry our first reading from Malachi it's page 969 in our Bibles 969 Malachi 2, where we read in verse 10 of the covenant of our fathers that the men of Malachi's day were profaning by their faithlessness. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Notice the violent language that he then uses of these people in verse 11. Judah has become faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign God. Here was God's beloved bride and she is committing adultery. Going off with another husband. Going off with another God. And if that were not bad enough, there is another crime that the people of Judah have committed. 
this time deserting the wife by covenant, their own wife. For not only were they leaving God in their adultery, but they were leaving their wives in adultery as well. By their wedding, they had bound themselves to their wives, but they were not being faithful to their promises. So they were not being faithful to their wives, and if you're not faithful to your wife, you're not faithful to the God of faithfulness. So we read in verse 14, but you say, why doesn't he? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. You made a contract with her and you're not keeping your contract. You're going back on your word. God signed the wedding certificate as a witness to their marriage, but the men were not fulfilling their promises. They were leaving their wives for other women even though God was the witness of their declaration of faithfulness. This adultery defeats the very purpose of God's creation for from the beginning God has made them to be one. A man shall leave his father and mother and, and join to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And so here in Malachi we read in verse 15, did he, that's God, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Here was God's way of creating humans and humanity, uniting men and women together into a procreative unity called marriage and that is the reason for this unity is to have children and to live long enough in unity to raise them as godly offspring the best thing you can do for your children is to be united faithfully to your spouse marital harmony is the context in which to raise children it's what creates the stability and the security which is so important in the children's psychological well-being. And it's what God did in creating marriage. It was to unite man and woman. So when Jesus was asked about divorce, remember how he took the questioners back to the creation. For God's command against adultery reflects his creative purposes. Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two will become one, flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate here is Jesus' view of marriage, the view of creation in Genesis, the, re, the view reflected in the adultery commandment, the view reflected in Malachi 2. For breaking the marriage bond is to commit violence. It's breaking apart what God has united it's ripping apart what God has created himself. So Malachi 2 says, verse 15, did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit. Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who hates and divorces, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in your spirit. Do not be faithless. Faithfulness to your covenant promises, to your wife, to your husband. Faithlessness is the violence that God detests. God is faithful. Fullness himself. 
And God's people must be faithful. Nowhere more so than in our marriages that symbolise the marriage between God and his people. And so we turn to our marriage. Or the marriage of our friends or our neighbours or our fellow Christians. For there we see not only husband and wife, but Christ of the church. For we've been betrothed, we Christians, to the faithful Saviour, and we mustn't move from our husband. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, page 1166. 1166. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. And I'm picking it up from verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. There is only one Lord Jesus Christ, there is only one gospel. Jesus is the merciful and faithful high priest who will never fail us and we must never turn to another. It's so easy to become spiritually adulterous, either moving from the Saviour to some alternative to Jesus or moving to some alternative Jesus who didn't die and didn't rise from the dead, who, who is an Indian mystic and spent his life in India and came back and taught us how to... It's just not in the Bible, it's not true of history, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Or to be in love with the world instead of with Jesus. For this is the accusation in James 4 when the Apostle James wrote, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Notice what is being called there. It's adulterous. Our church's commitment to Christ must not be ever, must always be rather unalloyed devotion to our husband as the one and only Lord and love of our lives. And as in our relationship to God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to remain faithful. So in our relationship with each other, we must be faithful. We mustn't be adulterous. For as the Apostle Paul wrote, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers will inherit the kingdom of God. God is essentially faithful and God's people must also be faithful. God's faithfulness is a covenant faithfulness and God's people must be faithful to their covenant promises. God is the faithful husband of his people and God's people must be faithful to their own spouse. Adultery strikes at the very heart of being God's person. All this sounds very harsh and some may be sitting squirming within their own hearts and feeling, but Philip, I am an adulterer. I have committed adultery. What if I've already committed adultery? Does that verse mean I won't? I can't inherit the kingdom of God? Is adultery the unforgivable sin? Well, friends, it means two things. Firstly, that adultery is so serious as to exclude you from God's kingdom. You must not be deceived by the media, 
by the movies, by the television. Some surveys show that in the 1990s, primetime network entertainment offered sexual remarks or behaviour every four minutes. From the monitoring of network programs, the Lewis Harris and Associates estimated that the average viewer witnesses 14,000 sexual events annually, nearly all involving unmarried people. An analysis of one week of network primetime TV found that intercourse was mentioned or intimated by unmarried couples 90 times and by married couples once. All sex, from the media's point of view, happens outside of marriage and no sex happens inside of marriage. I'm not all keen on watching sex inside marriage on television either. But the only sex that happens on television is adulterous sex or fornication. And when you watch it time after time after time, year after year after year, your mind is being bent by the false prophets of our day. In fact, more than two-thirds of the time, in another analysis of 220 scenes of unmarried sex, the activity is portrayed as desirable. And less than 10% of the time was the sexual activity between unmarried adults portrayed as undesirable. Do not be deceived, my friends. You cannot be one of God's people and commit adultery. It is absolutely incompatible. But secondly, two things I said to notice in this passage. Secondly is to note that Christ's death was of such magnitude and of such enormity in God's grace as to pay the penalty for all sin, even such sins that are as serious as adultery. For in the very next verse, the Bible says, and that is what some of you were. Some of the Christians in Corinth were adulterers. Not are, but were. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love the word, but. For the last sentence is not adulterer. The last sentence starts with the word, but. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. How? Well, by the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection and by the pouring out of his spirit to transform and change us. Isn't that the most fantastic news? Your wife, your husband may never forgive you. Your children, your parents may not forgive you. Your neighbours and your work colleagues may not forgive you. You may not be able to forgive yourself. But... God, through the death of his one and only Son, forgives you and regenerates your spirit so that you can live washed clean of what you have done, sanctified, set apart for him and declared all right with him. Not because God thinks adultery doesn't matter, but because God thinks adultery matters so much that he sent his son to die so that you would be forgiven. If you look on the back of our outlines, down in that little prayer that we often pray, I often finish sermons with, you look at that little grey section there. I'm going to say something more before I pray it, but I want to draw your attention to it right now because it's so important that those who, especially those who are adulterers, might see what it is that we pray and hear what it is that God does for us. You see, the person who comes to Christ prays 
I know I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty. I need forgiveness. Is that you? Well, you thank God for what he has done, you see, for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven, that he rose from the dead to give me new life. The last word on my world, on my life, on me is not going to be adulterer. He's going to be one of God's people, forgiven, pardoned, changed. And so we ask, please forgive me. And please change me that I might live differently. I might now live with Jesus as ruler. For that is the change that God's will is for his Christian people. It's our sanctification. It's our setting aside to be different. We read of it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. And the sanctification he's speaking of is specifically explicitly sexual at this point. For he goes on that you abstain from sexual immorality and that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honour, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. For that is still how the Gentiles, that's still how the nations live. They fail in their sexuality and they com the common message that they are pounding into us via the media day in, day out, is the acceptability of sexual immorality when you don't have to live very long to see the families destroyed by sexual immorality. Wives left with children, husbands left with children, grandparents losing their grandchildren, grandchildren losing their uncles and their aunts and their cousins because of sexual immorality. Nothing destroys life in this world so much as adultery. Nothing destroys an own person so much. For all other sin is outside your body, but sexual sin is against your own self. But, that's, a, that's the word, isn't it? That's the word we need to hear, but. It's the wonderful word, but. God in Christ Jesus can forgive you and change you so that you no longer live like the rest of the world. So let's turn back to our prayer here to conclude. Do you know that you need forgiveness? Do you know that you've really been rebelling against God? Well, if so, I want you to join with me in thanking God for what he has done in sending his son for you to die and rise again, that you be forgiven and given a new life. And ask with me that God would forgive you and change you, that you might live his way with Jesus as ruler. I'll pray this prayer out loud and invite you then to be praying it in the quietness of your own mind to God above. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I am guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. And if that's your prayer, friends, if that really is your prayer, you will be forgiven. I know that because Jesus has died for you. And you will be changed, I know that, because Jesus is not dead, he's alive and sends his spirit to bring change to us.